Welcome to the third part of my series, Introducing Quantum Computing. In this part, I'm going to cover what quantum computers could actually do and some comments on the current quantum landscape. So here are some of the possible applications of quantum computers. One comes from this idea presented by Richard Feynman that I talked about in the first episode of quantum systems being particularly good at simulating quantum systems. This means that quantum computers have promising applications to situations that involve simulating the properties of chemical systems. For example, in drug discovery, analyzing the properties of the chemicals needed for new fertilizers in agriculture, and in material science, studying the properties of new batteries, for example. There's also possible applications to speeding up aspects of machine learning, the field of quantum machine learning. There's possible speed ups in optimization problems, which have a range of applications in many different fields. And there's also people looking into speed ups in financial modeling from quantum computers. There's even more unusual applications, for example, in video games, generating randomness for worlds in those games. One thing to watch out for is quantum hype. You can get a lot of claims of the amazing things that quantum computing will do to change the world for problems that people care about a lot, like will they cure cancer? Will they solve climate change? And it's important to be aware that they're not going to solve these problems anytime soon. When we build quantum computers that are at a scale that can solve useful problems, then they might be able to play a role in solving things that contribute to these larger issues. But it's not something that's on the doorstep. But it's also important to keep in mind the huge potential impacts of even just a single speed up from a quantum computer. For example, if a quantum computer helps discover a new fertilizer, then that could have huge implications for the world globally if it improves food production. Now, in the longer term, there's also some more ambitious applications to think about. For example, we discussed in the earlier part about Shaw's algorithm. And having computers that can solve problems at that level is something that's more in the far future because you need a really good computer to be fault tolerant, to be able to solve those kinds of problems. There's also the future possibility of actually implementing something like the test that Deutsch was imagining for testing the many worlds theory against collapse theory of trying to actually reverse a quantum measurement. To do this, we'd need to have some way of simulating an observer. So we'd need a theory of how to simulate an artificial intelligence on a computer first, and then somehow put that onto a quantum computer. It's something people in the quantum foundations community think about and would be cool in the long term to work towards that goal. And maybe my favorite long term application is the possible surprises. So I've left some space for all those future possible applications that we can't predict right now there in the long run. Now I wanted to give you some context on what's happening in the quantum landscape right now. There are quantum computers that really exist today. You can access them via the cloud, for example. They're noisy quantum computers, meaning that they have this problem of errors, which means that they can't be used to do a useful computation yet more efficiently than a classical computer. We have reached a point where quantum systems are able to solve some problems much faster than a classical computer, 
but not useful problems. And they're ones that are tailored for being something that quantum computers are particularly good at. This is what people often call quantum supremacy. This milestone is also a moving target because when you use a quantum computer to do something much faster than a classical computer can, then people can come up with classical algorithms for trying to solve that task as well. And then if someone comes up with an efficient way to do that problem with the classical computer, then you have to make your quantum computer solve a bigger problem to be able to beat the best classical ones again. And so you have this moving target with this milestone. It was first claimed to be achieved in 2019 in an experiment from Google. And then there's been this constant back and forth with these quantum supremacy demonstrations and then classical simulations catching up. But we have reached that point at the moment. There's also been some really cool advances recently in demonstrating the building blocks of quantum error correction and fault tolerance. That's really cool because it means that these bits of revolutionary theory that showed that building a fault tolerant quantum computer is actually in principle possible have been validated in terms of the recent developments in experimental progress and engineering showing that the theory holds up and there are initial demonstrations of quantum error correction and fault tolerance being achieved using various different hardware platforms. So that's really cool. People always ask what's the time scale for when quantum computers are going to be useful. This is very difficult to predict because it depends on so many different moving parts and also on unpredictable developments in terms of how quickly different hardware platforms were able to solve different problems, how well we can compile algorithms down to run on a quantum computer with fewer resources, just orchestrating everything needed. There's lots of unpredictable aspects with how easy or difficult those challenges will be to solve. That leads to lots of different estimates for usefulness across the community. So you might get optimistic ones of say three years or end of the decade estimates, or there are many quantum computing skeptics out there who think that the challenges of building a fault tolerant quantum computer are extremely large and that's going to put us into needing a long time to build one that's good enough to solve a useful problem. At the moment, there's a global race to try and implement the first useful applications on a quantum computer, which includes universities, academic labs, governments, tech giants, and startups. Lots of different parts of the quantum ecosystem all trying to contribute to building quantum computing as soon as possible. And I also wanted to introduce some of the different terms of the quantum era that you'll hear if you're part of the quantum community or reading about quantum computing. One aspect is all the different eras of quantum computing. There's a phrase called NISC, so this stands for Near Term Intermediate Scale Quantum Devices. And the idea of NISC is to actually build a quantum computer out of physical qubits. So it's pre doing this quantum error correction stuff, just using the physical qubits, try and get the error of those physical qubits as low as possible and see how much we can squeeze out of these systems. And many parts of the quantum computing field are trying to get the most out of NISC that we can. And there might be applications, for example, for chemical simulations that we can actually get something useful from a NISC era quantum computer without needing all the resources and technology of building a fault tolerant one. Then there's this era of actual fault tolerance, having that fully fledged low error quantum computer. And there's something in between called early fault tolerant, which is thinking about what could we get from quantum computers before reaching this fully fault tolerant stage, but also using some of the techniques from quantum error correction. 
now we're on the verge of entering this era as a community. There's also the idea of hybrid computing, which is using classical computers and computers together when running algorithms. Maybe you figure out that a bunch of operations in the algorithm can be put on the classical computer because it can actually do them faster and you save the quantum computer for the parts that really need quantum computing and try and optimize that way and do hybrid algorithms. Another aspect of quantum computing is all the different parts of the quantum computing stack and development. There are developments happening in terms of hardware, just trying to push forward engineering the hardware using whichever physical implementation from the ones I mentioned or something else that people are working on. There's the software level. There's a load of different problems to solve in terms of software for how to program quantum computers and at all the different levels of the software stack from a user programming it to orchestrating all of the ways that the quantum computer works on a lower level. And then this middleware that sits between the software and hardware to translate between the algorithms that you're trying to run, actually controlling the quantum systems in the lab. Then on this higher theory level, you've got this whole theory of quantum error correction, trying to improve on that. And also lots of work happening on quantum algorithms, because one of the biggest questions with quantum computing is what is the best thing to use them for when we have them? If we had one right now, what would be the best thing to do with it? There's lots of exciting and important work happening to do with trying to both come up with great algorithms, but also compile them down, trying to squeeze down how many resources those algorithms need. Finally, I've just got a few of the types of things that people in the field are working on right now. So one is doing case studies. This is taking promising algorithms and then trying to see what's an example of running the algorithm that we could do on today's quantum computers. It's not going to be faster than a classical computer right now. You can do it on a real quantum computer today as a proof of principle and then find an algorithm such that if it scales up, then you should be able to do it more efficiently on a larger scale quantum computer than on a classical computer. There's various case studies in that sense happening using different algorithms with different possible applications in various industries. There's also benchmarking, which is an area of trying to actually have measures for how good a quantum computer is, because that is difficult to even now, what quantity should we be optimizing for? Because if you've got loads of noisy qubits, then that's not very helpful. But it's not just errors, because if you've got only a small number of qubits with zero error, then if it's not enough qubits, you can just simulate it with a classical computer. There's this balance of trying to figure out exactly what's the balance of qubits and errors to optimize for and to use when comparing which quantum computer is better than another one. There's also milestone experiments trying to achieve these milestones, like certain aspects of quantum error correction or these quantum supremacy results. The one that people want to work towards is achieving quantum advantage, doing something useful faster than a classical computer on a quantum computer. Finally, an important idea at the moment is co-design. That's the idea of combining the knowledge in all these different areas together to try and get the most out of today's quantum computers and the ones in the near future as possible. Thinking about an algorithm together with error correction, together with the hardware and the software, thinking about how to optimize all those different parts to work together. That needs lots of communication between people working on those different parts. And in the future, it might not be needed and that people working on these different parts can just think of them independently. But right now, to get the most out of quantum systems, what we're seeing is trying to optimize everything together in this co-design way. That is an idea of 
some of the applications of quantum computing and what's happening today in the quantum computing landscape. In the final part of this intro to quantum computing series, I will talk a bit about the future outlook of the field and just give a summary of everything that I've talked about in this series. Join me for the next episode.